thing. Uh, it, it's a communion Sunday today. So if you don't have your communion elements nearby, go grab them and you know, whatever you've got works because Jesus used what he had on the table that day. So I've got some, uh, uh, some little, I forget what these cookies are called. Digestive cookies. Digestive wafers, yes. That's I what I've got. And my Ruibos, Linda, just for you, in my Love is Love mug. So, Ritz cracker. <laughs> it works. So grab your communion stuff. Um, and we are celebrating Interdependence Sunday, which is kind of new to me, but I liked it. I think that's especially important for us. Um, this year, as we have realized how interdependent we are and how essential we are to one another and how often the folks who are the most essential are the ones who are maybe also the most vulnerable. So um, we're honoring Interdependence Sunday to follow our nation's Independence Day celebration yesterday. And we will have fellowship hour again after worship. So if you would like to participate, you'll get an invitation at the end of this worship to um, to, for your camera to go live. If you don't want to be seen, if you're still in your jammies or your party remnants are still around, it's okay. You can still see all of us. Just don't accept that invitation. But you might get it a couple of times just because I'm not always sure people have received it. So I might hit it a couple of times. I'm not trying to bully or belliger, belligerent you. Um, I just want to make sure you're invited. So watch for that. Today, there will be no children's story during this worship service, and we have no junior deacon, but that's not really going to be our norm for the summer. It just happens to be the way it is today. So, um, and we're doing something new, which is a little contemplative piece in worship. And so it won't be exactly the same every week, but um, we will have a, a contemplative element of worship in our summer worships. So... Um, to bring us a little deeper into our practice and into our presence, um, into the power of God and within our spirit and in our world. So um, kind of excited about that. And if you have a story or a poem or a song or a prayer or an idea to share with us about worship or a ministry this summer, please let us know. Even if you've never reached out with an idea before, this is your moment. Um, you can contact us by calling the church number and it'll direct, um, and you can hit a button and it'll come directly to my cell phone or you can email us. But if you don't have a directory and you don't know how to email us, just Google the church number and you can come straight into my cell number from there and uh, lay your awesome idea on us. So that's part of what makes North Madison Congregational so special as we're seeing in these virtual worships as the amazing ideas and energy and yes, spirit of our folks. So thank you for all the ways you lovingly support uh, the ministries at this church and one another in our community. So I am Heather Arkovich. I am the um, pastor at North Madison Congregational Church in Diaspora. And I am joined here by uh, two powerful women of God, Dawn, who is our virtual deacon and who will be taking our joys and concerns and telling you about that in a moment. And Linda, who is our minister of music and um, brings us our scripture and has been organizing behind the scenes with Scott Chassie and his new amazing sidekick, Jack, and our amazing choir members with their spirit of yes and musicians, some really neat new expressions of music that we hope are gonna be really moving for you. They were really moving for me as I was loading them in and it's a labor of love. So if you would like to support this new ministry, we pay our new friend Jack to help Scott to organize things um, into the beautiful morsels of music that they're offering. And we estimate it costs us about $45 a Sunday. So if you would like to sponsor a Sunday and you can do it in someone's honor, you can do it anonymously or in celebration of something, just like we used to do with the flowers when we were in the sanctuary, um, you can just let the church office know and we can put a little acknowledgement up on our screen um, or not, if you prefer not but it's a wonderful way to support all the hard work that Linda and Scott and Jack and our choir have been pouring in to our music ministries. So 
So in that, I will turn it over to Dawn, our virtual deacon, to tell you what else you need to know this morning. Good morning. My name is Dawn Barber for Deacons, and we warmly welcome you to today's worship, where we are celebrating God's creation with our Tuesdays in the garden and all of our garden spaces. And I didn't know this, but I brought my daisies down, so I'm in the theme. So um, we just want to ask you uh, during our worship, if you have joys or concerns, um, put um, uh, put them in um, capitals so I can see them easier. And then later in the in the service, I will share them with everyone. And we always ask, um, just be. This is a public forum, so maybe not use last names. Be discretionary. If you, um, another announcement, if you are not receiving our NMC emails, um, we send out every Friday, check your spam. And um, if there's any problems, call, call the church office or email us and we'll get that straightened up. And then I'm also excited um, to do another new member class. Um, we'll do it by Zoom. We have one um, interested person and if anyone else is, um, is interested in learning more about our church, then um, call the office and we'll f figure something out. And then the last thing is um, our giving in all its forms continues to be important. So we thank you, those who are reaching out to one another and our neighbors, and thank you for con um, continuing to um, keep our ministries and staff going. There's a link in the, in the chat that you can use to get directly to our website. Um, you can also set up a recurring gift as a sustaining member. Um, one other thing, we are in ongoing conversations about the safety of our members and the building's use. We will continue to worship, worship virtually through the summer and our, um, we're determining our criteria for a safe opening in the fall. Um, and lastly, we have uh, signs for sale. The We Believe yard signs are $10, and we welcome volunteers to sit at the church for people to come for socially distanced pickups. So please call the church office if you're available to serve in this way. All right, and now we'll start our service with a gathering. Thank you, Dawn. And I forgot to mention, <clears throat> excuse me, I am going to take some vacation this week. So the things I normally participate in, Bible study, staff meeting, those sorts of things, will not be meeting this week. If you need me for a pastoral emergency, though, don't hesitate to call. And again, you can call my cell phone or you can call the church number and be connected to my cell phone through there if you don't have my cell number. Okay, I'm here and I'm available. Barbara and I are just going to try and take some time. Uh, in her last week before she starts seeing clients at her new job, yahoo, and um, get some things done around this house. So um, so that's where I'll be if you're looking for me this week. So now let us be in a spirit of worship. As we wish a blessed Interdependence Day weekend to you and yours. As Cal said, out of many, one. And let us be in a spirit of worship as we begin by acknowledging those on whose ancestral lands we gather. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples have walked on this land in their own nations. They offered assistance to the first European travelers here and shared their knowledge for survival in what could be a harsh climate. They were removed against their wills and at great loss of their cultures, their ancestral homes, their history, and their lives. We acknowledge the peoples who lived in and around the area now called Madison, the Pequots, the Mohegans, the Hamanassets, the Monunkatucks, and 
I missed the last one. <laughs> we acknowledge their loving stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Sorry, Linda. The Quinnipiacs. There we go. Thank you. They are God's beloved children, beloved children, sacred and beautiful, and they are spiritually connected to this land. We repudiate the doctrine of discovery that declared the land to be empty when European explorers, pilgrims, traders, and settlers arrived. We also acknowledge the peoples indigenous to other lands. Who were kidnapped brought here against their will at great peril to themselves and their families. And forced to work for generations in inhumane conditions without compensation. To build the wealth of this nation and many of its church's members. At the time of this nation's declaration of independence from British rule, these people did not receive freedom. On this Interdependence Day, we repent of the legacy of our forebears and embrace a renewed commitment to healing ancient and contemporary hurts. And we and remember Dr. King's teaching. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. As Betty Lou Hamer taught us, nobody's free until everybody's free. Gentle creator, God of justice and love, may our hearts and the work of our lives be for the true freedom of all your children. May true healing come to this nation and all nations, so all your peoples may live together in safety, joy, trust, and peace. Amen. 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 Here's our opening. <laughs>
to do a new thing and settle ourselves in for some centering prayer this morning. So if you are not used to centering prayer, let's start by getting your body settled in the space you're in. Give it a try. If you're feeling like this doesn't seem like your thing, just give it a try. It's only going to be a minute and a half. What could go wrong? And if it is your thing, a minute and a half is still time to get somewhere. So we are settling into our space. Feel the weight of your body resting on whatever's supporting it. If you can plant your feet firmly on the ground, that's best. If you're in bed, have your feet up, you know, imagine, imagine your feet planted firmly. And kind of unfocus your eyes a little bit. And I want you to focus now on your breathing. If you want to close your eyes, that'd be perfect. And I'm going to light our candle. And I want you to focus on the in-breath, breathing in through your nose and out. Again, through your nose. Breathe in. And feel the air just under your nose as you do it. Here comes our candle. Breathe in God's light. Breathe out God's peace. Breathe in God's light. Breathe out God's peace. Imagine breathing in and taking that light of God inside yourself and exhaling deep peacefulness out from you and into the universe. Keep breathing at your own natural pace in God's light. Feel the warmth, feel the healing in that light. 
and breathe out God's peace. And imagine it stretching out to all the parts of the universe. Keep breathing in God's light and out God's peace. If your mind wanders, that's okay. Just bring it back to the candle or the feeling of the air just under your nose. As you continue to breathe, remembering God breathed the first breath of life into you. Amen. So that's it, that's how it's done. And we'll take that spirit of peace with us now as we turn our hearts to our scripture. And here's Linda to read it for us. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, excerpts from verses 16 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of a man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Abba, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes. For such was your gracious will. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. So this passage is a favorite for my of mine. Um, I have a lot of favorite passages, but I particularly like this one because of the yoke imagery and because the imagery of Jesus as a glutton and a drunkard. <laughs> because, you know, one of the things that happens to you um when you become a pastor is all of a sudden people and you, some of you have done this so i'm sure this will sound familiar as people start to go when they they use a little colorful language so they're like oh pastor sorry sorry like as if i've never sworn before in my life or never been around anyone didn't grow up in a family or around people who you know use colorful language and remember they say that those who use the most colorful language tend to be the most intelligent. So I don't think we have anything to be ashamed of there if we, but you know, a little color slip in our language now and again. But they also tend to be shocked if you behave in normal human ways. You know, when, when a parishioner sees you at the grocery store for the first time, or, you know, God forbid out in a, you know, restaurant having an adult beverage with your friends. Um, we tend to think that the people of God should be somehow other than regular people. And that's why I love this passage, because it makes it clear that, you know, people, when John came, he fasted, he was fastidious, and he didn't eat, he didn't drink. The man ate locusts and honey and wore a hair shirt. And y'all said he was crazy. So now we have Jesus, and Jesus comes, and he ate, and he drank. The Last Supper, he was drinking alcohol with his friends on a sacred occasion. He ate things that people said were unclean for a rabbi to eat. And y'all don't want to follow him either. No matter what a person of God does, the one thing it seems like it's 100% for sure we can expect 
is that people are going to complain about it and question our validity. Isn't that something? Which brings me to the other part of the passage that I really like, which is unrelated, but I'll tie it back together. So this yoking thing. Now, I grew up in Milford, Connecticut, where um, we didn't have a lot of active farms, but in Orange, just adjacent, there still are. And you drive along some of the country roads and see the big wooden yokes up on people's porches. People mount them on their houses and you drive by and see the yokes and it just feels so rustic and homey. Well, when I worked overseas in West Africa, and that was the early 90s, my first job there was working with yokes just like that as a new technology, a new technology in the 90s. People are hoeing, they're, they're you know, raising food for their whole families with a, a wooden stick with a metal blade stuck in the end and you hoe with it, it's backbreaking. And so the whole family is out there working so the children can't go to school because they're needed. It's a lot of work. So my job was to help to teach these farmers, because I had all this experience having grown up in Milford, you know, to teach these farmers how to pair up a pair of oxen. We would, we would get them from the wandering Tuaregs, right? So the Tuareg community would come through and they had um, these beautiful white dromedary cattle. And we would choose pairs that were about two years old, about the same height, similar temperaments if we could. And then we'd have to teach these animals to work in, in a yoke like that. So we had to teach these farmers and the Eve people are not people of great stature, right? They're on the smaller side, these big, huge dromedary. They're the white cattle with the big humps and the horns. And so we were teaching these pairs of cattle to work in a yoke and these Eve farmers to work with them to plow fields, to raise corn and millet and things. And um, it was wonderful. It was just wonderful, but I learned a ton about what it really is to work in a yoke and what it really is to work behind yoked animals as well. Because you have to walk, you know, in the row holding the old fashioned, you know, plow upright. And, um, and so that's what we did. And one of my favorite stories was because, you know, I was so well equipped as a young 20 something woman from, uh, Milford to do this work that some of the other farmers, you know, who were all men and had worked their fields forever were not 100% confident that I had something to offer them. So one day we were at the training center and uh, we had just brought in all these new animals who were just learning how to do this. And as I arrive, my little bright eyed self, uh, one of the um, new farmers was infuriated with his two animals. He had these two really green uh, oxen and they were stuck and they weren't moving. And he, now y'all know I'm a vegetarian and an animal lover. He was beating the living poo poo out of these animals to try and get them to move in the yoke with the plow. And um, they weren't having it. They were just standing there and their white sides were getting pinker and pinker and puffier and puffier as he beat them and they were not budging. And so now I walk up. And so the trainer at the center turns and says, oh, well here, we have the animal traction um, expert, you know, cause they thought they were gonna have some fun with me and he was gonna relieve a little bit of the pressure that his, his learning farmer was under. And I'm walking up horrified at what I'm seeing happening to these animals. And so I'm having this whole, you know, naive experience and the trainer turns to me and now I'm in the spotlight and all the rest of the farmers who are standing around for this training are looking to me and they're all doing it with sort of a, you know, you can imagine the looks on their faces, right? Bemused, um, they knew better than I. And so I leaned in. And so I don't know where it came from. It had to be a God moment. I said, well, you know, in my broken local language in French, you know, where I come from, <laughs> they say, <laughs> if you can't drive an animal without a stick, then you can't drive an animal. I made that up. So if you want to start saying that you can to give me <laughs> credence for my newly minted proverb, if you can't drive an animal without a stick, you can't drive an animal. So they all look at me like, oh, sure, lady, you know, 
and they hand me the reins. <laughs> so now I've got the reins and the plow, and they're all standing back because they want me to have as hard a time as possible. And I remember as I'm standing there, it's like that dream where you wake up on the on the stage at Carnegie Hall with a piano in front of you and you don't know how to play and you don't have the music, but the audience is there. That was my moment. And so I'm holding the reins and this and this plow. And I suddenly remember that the one thing my my trainer told me from Peace Corps that was useful in this moment was turn the animals toward home and they'll always go. <laughs> so I did. I just turned the plow. I pulled the reins and they went. They went. Those animals took off and everyone stood back because they were so ready to laugh at me, right? <laughs> stood back like, are you kidding? And I... <laughs> You can see, I still love that moment to this day, 30 years <laughs> later. It was a good day. So why am I telling you that story now? Well, you know, being in a yoke is not always easy. And Jesus' scripture here, that if you take up my yoke, it'll be, it'll be easier, it'll be okay, sounds so poetic when you're driving through the streets of Orange and looking at beautiful right, heritage wooden yoke pieces on people's homes. But it's a whole different ball of wax when you're really working with animals in a yoke or trying to work behind the animals in that yoke. It's not easy. It's not easy to plow fields. It's not easy to do it together. It's not easy to do it alone. But what I learned in that moment was something that has stuck with me a long time and I think is probably one of the hidden meanings in this teaching from Jesus. And that is that when you do the work of God, when you do the work of goodness, it's not gonna be easy. But you wanna be darn sure that you have a partner beside you if you're in the yoke, who's gonna pull as hard as you do, who's gonna bring balance, who when you get tired or stumble, is gonna keep going and keep a pace, who you can rely on. And you wanna know that the person or the ideal that's driving you is worthy of being driven by. You wanna know that you're in the right track. And if you're on the right track and you've got the right partner, you can, you can get through just about any field and take yourselves all the way home. It sounds simple and poetic, but it's really not when you think of the nitty gritty of it. And there's a lot that comes up in fields. There's holes and stones, the blades break, things happen. You can lose your footing pretty easily. It can be muddy, thick as heck. It can be dry and you can be suffering from the dryness. But as they say, faster alone, further together. Jesus doesn't say that the way is gonna be easy. Jesus says that my yoke is, and it is easier to yoke ourselves to God in a deep abiding way than it is to be a cynic and try and go it alone, just beat the crud out of life. It might be satisfying in the moment, but you're not building better relationship with those animals that could get you a lot further. You're not building deeper wisdom in yourself if you're just battling yourself way through life instead of stepping back taking a breath seeing what it is that you need to know gaining the wisdom and then re-engaging to go further <laughs> learning is hard and it's vulnerable work they say though show me somebody who hasn't made a mistake and i'll show you somebody who's not trying something new jesus was a person who <laughs> really advocated for people doing a lot of new things. They may not seem new from our perspective, but from his cultural perspective, they really were. He upset so many apple carts. It's amazing. It seems like every new community he came into, he had something to say about it. Every time somebody thought they could relax because they knew where the proverb was going that he was teaching, he'd spin it and aim it back at them. His message was always, if you're in it with God, then you're really in it and it's going to be tough but we can do it and it's going to be so fruitful so joyful in the end it's worth going all the way for 
So the part about being a glutton and a drunkard, which is also a favorite part for me, <laughs> kind of plays into this. Because I think so many of us think that we're imperfect. We haven't done it well enough. We're not the kind of person that never. And that was never something that Jesus said. In fact, he tried every way he could to make the point that whoever you are, right, wherever you are in life's journey, you're part of this kingdom. You're part of this whole thing God is doing. God doesn't want to do it alone. God wants us to yoke up. And God wants to help. God wants to see us bring the amazing things into the world that the scriptures promise. And we sit back and say, well, things are going wrong. Where's God? But God says, I'm standing right back here with the plow. All you have to do is yoke up. And if you yoke up with Jesus, you're going to make it. It doesn't matter if you've been drinking or gluttonously eating. It doesn't matter if you've been hanging out with the tax collectors or the sinners. In fact, in a lot of ways, that's exactly who God expects you to be and exactly what God expects you to be doing. Because that's exactly where Jesus went to live out his life and ministry. He went straight to the places where people thought they weren't good enough. He went straight to the places, the fields, where people thought they weren't fertile. And those are the places he plowed. And those are the places he calls us to plow. Not because it's easy, not because we're going to make a lot of money at it, or even a lot of friends. But because when we go there, the friends we make, the gifts we find, are going to be so much more meaningful. So much more meaningful. So much more healing for us in ways we can't even imagine right now than it would have been if we just stepped back cynically, laughing at the people who are trying for something new or trying to beat the crud out of life with a stick to get our way instead of stepping back to figure out why is it that these oxen aren't moving? What is the message that they have for me? We have to learn as human beings to trust one another and to trust ourselves because just as we were reflecting on a little bit in our very brief meditation a minute ago, the Spirit of God is within us. The light of God is within us. It really is. We have to practice to fan those flames, to brighten that light, to bring that Spirit forward. We have to practice. We have to get out into the field yoke up and start pulling. And as we start to pull, we will find it's not as hard as we thought or where it is hard, we're not alone. Real things are happening. There's a lot to get things to grow. You know, there's so much to do with a field. You gotta clear the rocks, you gotta ameliorate the soil. Got to get out and do the plowing. and That's a team effort. And then you got to wait and water and weed, move the insects, tend and tend and tend. It doesn't really end, but it's so worth it. And then the sweat of your body and the strength you've developed becomes the thing that brings new fruit, right? New nurturing, new food for your body and for your soul to strengthen you further, to share with others who need strengthening. We were brought into this world just to protect ourselves until we lived as long as we could, until we died. We were brought into this world to live richly, to be real, to be messy together. Have a drink once in a while, as long as you can handle it. And if you can't handle it, then don't do that and do other meaningful things with your friends. But there's so much in the world to partake of. Any spiritual practice that says, well, if you're part of our church, you, you can't do this and that and that. That's not real. If we couldn't do it, God would not have put it here. 
and put us here. It's about finding the wisdom that's in each experience, finding the wisdom that's in each practice, and giving ourselves forgiveness when we mess it up. Jesus was a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And wisdom is justified by her children. That is a weird phrase, but that's what the scripture says. So what does it mean? When we're out there plowing, we may look a fool, but the fruits of our labor will show eventually. So we can hide from the folks who wanna point fingers at us and tell us we're all wrong, or we can just stick to the row we're in, get in our lane, put our shoulder to it, and plow with all we've got as the people we happen to be, with all our weird quirks and idiosyncrasies and failings. Just put our shoulder in and go. And at the end, the end of that row, the end of the day, our fruits are gonna show. And it won't matter what anybody has said about us. It won't matter what anybody laughed at or pointed at. It won't matter the places where people picked up a stick and beat us around the head a little bit. What'll matter is those fruits. It'll matter to us. It'll matter to those who really matter in the world who've been nourished by our refusal to step back and give up. And it'll matter to God who's waiting for us, who's got his hands on the plow or hers. Thanks be to God. So it's now time for our joys and concerns. And um, I'm going to try and take myself off of uh, fancy view here. Okay, there we go. There we go. And so here is our virtual dean, Deacon Don, and our prayers for today. Am I okay? I'm here. So this is our special time when we share. We read aloud the joys and concerns of our um, of our friends. So lots of joys today. So Orlean shares that it was her eight-year-old grandson's birthday yesterday. So that was a wonderful day to be born. And Kate H. is very happy to have Patrick here all weekend, her Aww. grandson. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> and Sandy, she is celebrating giving birth to my Anna Banana who's 19 years old today. Oh, happy birthday, Anna. Happy birthday. And lots of joys for Eileen's voice. So quite a few. That was a beautiful song. And even though Cal didn't say this was a joy, I love it. He said, together is one, interdependence. So that's our word of the day. That's beautiful, Cal. Thank you. I've got a joy um, from... Uh, Kate, that she's um, thrilled to have Luke sharing the week with them after not having seen him since Christmas. So, nice. Welcome home, Luke. And I guess I'll share your joy, Heather A., <laughs> for the love and beauty within our church community and the world. And also the concern, <sighs> let's have prayers for those who live with such fear in their hearts that they must bring others down physically, mentally, or emotionally. Yeah, thank you for that prayer. Prayers. Thank you for that prayer. And then Roberta, she is um, sharing a joy for all the people that reached out to her, um, offering to help following a lightning hit on their house on Wednesday. I didn't know about that, I'm so sorry. That was an exciting moment, by the way. Barb and I were putting the, the We Believe signs up at the church for people to pick up, and there was a huge crash of lightning and thunder, and then the sirens went off at the volunteer station right next door, and Roberta just calmly texts, those sirens that you're hearing right beside you, they're for me. We just got hit. We are like, what? <laughs> and I have to say, North Madison Volunteer Fire Department, wow, there had to be 30 guys there. I can't even, what, what, when they turn out, they turn out. Amazing. It's a good team, yeah. 
Or that you. lightning. It was, yeah, it was uh, attracted to that beautiful garden. See, you brought all that attention to your house. <laughs> but it was wise enough not to mess with the garden. It hit a tree and a wood pile and messed up the electrical system, but the gardens were untouched. It was a discerning okay. lightning strike. <laughs> good. Very good. So I think I didn't see anything else, but if Linda or if anyone else sees it. Um, we have a prayer. Did you mention Kate Davis's prayer about her son's partner receiving his oh. PhD this week? Oh, I didn't see that. That's awesome. So that's happy news, and that's a lot of work. Blessings on him. Wow. And well, if we've missed a prayer from you, please um, know that God has has heard it. And we also have exciting prayers that um, Lindia's Iron Maiden is off. And she's starting to, you know, get more positive reports. So she's moving toward physical therapy. So that's really good. We continue to hold uh, Karen and Tim in our prayers. We also hold the other Murphys. Um, Scott's family had to put their dog down this week. So prayers for Lucky and for all of them. They're on vacation now, but you know how that is. Their houses can have that hollow sound for a while. So we, we remember you as well. And all those that are missing a, an animal. And um, yeah. Okay, are we ready to go into a spirit of prayer? Let's pray. Oh, Holy One, what a gift it is to be here together, to remember our interdependence, to remember that we're not in this alone, to know that with you, even the impossible really can be possible in surprising unexpected ways. Help us to be so foolish that we're willing to lean in. Help us to be so naive that we're willing to keep trying. Help us to be so humble that we are willing to keep our hearts open. And God, we believe. Help our days of unbelief, our moments of pulling back, our moments of self-doubt or doubting one another, forgive us and free us from our judgments. When we judge ourselves or those around us as less than we are because you made us, so that means we are infinite. Maybe not in all the directions we want to go, but in important directions for us to discover. So help us all, God, to lean in, to trust one another and to trust you your Holy Spirit as it breathes in us, through us, and among us. And as we look out into our world today, oh God, there's so much that is broken. There's so many voices clamoring to be heard. There's so many who hurt. We hold all of them in prayer. We ask God that you, you would hold all of them in your holy, loving, healing heart. We don't know why it's so darn hard to be a human being sometimes. Why the hurts hurt so much. Why it is so hard to trust. Why we so often pull our tent stakes inward in protection instead of reaching out expansively in trust and possibility and hospitality and welcome. So today we offer you our hearts, oh God, you know us each and all best. Help us to live into becoming the people you created each of us to be and all of us together to become. Be with all those who are members of our community and members of the wider community who found us online today or through Facebook. Be with all those who are home wishing they had a community. Let this prayer reach out and warm them. And as we prepare our hearts, so oh God, to come together to your table from the intimacy of our own tables, we pray that your son's spirit would really enter the rooms we are in. Be present with us as he was with those folks on the walk in Emmaus, in that upper room with Thomas and the others, on that beach side, on that early morning, and all the places that he touched those that were hurting, that were trembling, and strengthened them. Let his spirit strengthen us. 
so that we may be courageous in our compassion. We may be strong in our trust, in our empathy and in our love. So we may have what it is we need this day in order to reach out and offer others what they need as well. We pray for all those who put themselves in harm's way for the good of others. We pray for all those who are at the end of their rope today. We pray for all those who are somewhere in between. We pray for our leaders on this Independence Interdependence Sunday. And we pray for all the followers. Let there be wisdom behind the plow. Let there be wisdom in the yoke. And that each one listen deeply to the wisdom of the other. Help us, God, to always remember we're not in this alone. That we're in it with you. And that each one of us is an expression of your face, worthy of love, worthy of trust, worthy of hearing and inclusion. And hear us now as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And today is a day we celebrate our um, citizenship here in creation. And so we have a beautiful piece that Roberta has uh, put together for us, set to a choir piece, um, celebrating our gardens and our our Tuesdays in the garden. So I'm going to screen share that as we prepare to come to the table. So this is your last chance to go and um, uh, prepare your communion elements <laughs> as we continue forward in our worship.
Amen. So wonderful to see those gardens. They say we are closer to God's heart in the garden than anywhere else on earth. And that sure seems right, looking at these gardens we have here. So thank you all for sharing your gardens. I understand we're gonna get the tour of Karen Miller's coming up soon, so that's exciting. And if you have a garden you'd like to share, um, we're always looking for new gardens. So please feel invited to let us know and show off a little and give us some tips. You can see my, look at, look at our hydrangea. So thank you, Sue Kenny. Not so shabby for even me with it green to brown thumb. <laughs> well, friends, I hope you've had time to collect your communion elements. Um, as we said earlier, you know, communion was something that happened the first time at a table of a friends who were together to celebrate Passover, and Jesus took up what was on the table. And one of the things that um, I think is sweetest about the story is that it really was just a group of friends sitting around the table. And he knew that his time was probably coming and he wanted to be remembered. And he knew how hard it is when we miss someone, when we're in grief, how much we want something tangible to hold on to, to remind us that they were really there, to feel the touch of their hand again in our lives and on our hearts. And so he thought, Here's something, here's something that we share. Here's something that we do together that's real. And he said, I hope that you will keep doing this. Even when I'm gone, that you'll always remember me. And remember the things we did together. And let it keep you going. I'm still with you. And here's the evidence. And so he took the bread, and he took the cup, and he blessed them. And he offered them to them again saying, this is my body and this is my blood, the cup of the new covenant. I'm offering them for you, I'm going all the way for you. Eat them as often as you do, remembering that, remembering me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, I'm with you. Our spirits are one. And then after he had been crucified and risen, when he met those disciples, do you remember that story, walking along the road together? And they were so upset that he was gone. And he said to them, they didn't recognize him. And he said to them, what are you talking about? And they said, are you the only one here who doesn't know this story? We thought, we thought he was the one. We thought he was the Messiah who would change everything. But he's gone. And then when Jesus was getting ready to leave them on the road and continue on his way, they invited him in. They insisted. They expressed that hospitality and they insisted that he come in with them. And he did. And then they knew him. When? In the breaking of the bread, in the blessing of the cup. He's with us. If we open our hearts, we can still feel him. We can still know he's there. And even if we don't feel him, he can feel us reaching out. And he's still there. So will you pray with me? Holy gracious God, we thank you for these gifts of bread and cup, these gifts of concrete remembrance of Jesus' love and friendship and teaching and guidance. We thank you for all the people who have come to this table in so many different ways, eating so many different elements from so many different parts of the world and history. And we join them now from the comfort of our own homes and our own tables remembering that home and that table where Jesus sat privately with his friends so long ago. He welcomed the spirit to that table and to their hearts. And we pray that he would send that spirit back into our tables and our homes and our hearts today and unite us in one fabric, one interdependence, one human faith family. We pray all this with loving hearts. Amen. Eat all of you of this bread and drink all of you of this cup and give thanks. And here is our choir while you do so. Here they come, I promise.
watching your faces. I don't know which one of you I love more. Let's pray. In the words of St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, let me sow faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, let me breathe in light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. It has been wonderful to be in worship with you. And now it's time for our beautiful blessing. Life is short, and we do not have much time to bless the hearts of those who make this journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the God who made us and loves us and makes this journey with us be with us now and forever. Amen. Friends, the worship is ended, so our service may begin. Shalom to you now. Shalom, my friend. Christ be.
with us this morning. Ah, oh, good stuff. Beautiful stuff. Thank you, singers. And check yourselves for ticks now. I'm going to be worried about you. 